um, let's talk about uh, photo restoration. So first and foremost, I'll just show you one thing that's really cool. So I get all my images for this uh, on Flickr. So Flickr has this really cool thing. <clears throat> so Flickr is a, um, a, a, an image hosting uh, website. But one of the neat things about Flickr is, um, is you can go to something called the Commons. And what the Commons is, is it's um, a series of archival photos that have been uploaded by museums all around the world. Uh, and it shows you all of the different museums that are participants on Flickr. And the nice thing about this service is because these are museum images that have been sort of lovingly scanned and uploaded to uh, the, this uh, website, is all of these are public domain. And what public domain is, uh, for those of you that are unaware, is a public domain image would be usable for pretty much any service. So if you're going to be using it for what I'm doing today, which is just to showcase how to up, up, um, you know, update a, and, and restore an image. But there's also, you could use it for commercial purposes. Like you could use an image like that in an advertisement. You could use it in a personal project that you're working with and uploading to your Instagram or your you know, personal portfolio online or that sort of thing. So that's the cool thing about public domain images uh, that are uploaded on this site under the comments. So when I looked for these photographs, uh, I'm often looking for you know, like an older photograph, or I'm looking for um, pr uh, profile photos, or I'm looking for portraits and that sort of thing and lots of stuff will come up. So I just wanted to uh, showcase this. If you're looking to sort of practice these, um, these uh, strategies uh, on uh, photos that are uh, just uploaded uh, to, to a, a site like Flickr, you can get them here and you can search for them specifically on the commons portal of Flickr because Flickr also hosts lots of images that people upload that don't have uh, public domain status. So just a little, little thing to note. So I got a couple images here. Uh, let's actually do change the view method in uh, manage mode here. And we'll talk about the two or three rather. So this is the image we're gonna be focusing on the majority of our updates today um, and sort of restoring this image. And this image is an interesting one because it has uh, a bit of discoloration that appears on the top portion here. And also there's this fairly large substantial smudge that appears on the left. This looks like it might've been water damage or, uh, or something that caused this, uh, this sort of light differentiation. And then there's also just a ton of noise and speckling that appears on the, the bottom portion of, of this image. And initially, uh, let me see here. Initially, when I was looking at this image, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about it when I bring it into edit mode here. But initially, when I was looking at this image, I was like, well, what, well, I mean, how much of this is actually, um, you know, damage that might have just been done to the actual hull of this, uh, the, of this, um, the body of this plane here. But actually, as you look up, especially in this section right here, where the speckling and the speckling here sort of matches that of beneath, it became quite apparent that this actually was just damage to the photograph and not necessarily damage to the plane itself. Although there is an element like this right here, which is actually a plane rivet, which is not damage to the photograph, but actually just a bolt that has uh, you know, been bolted into the plane. Um, so this is going to be what we're going to be focusing on primarily and talking about frequency separation for the purpose of restoring images. Um, this image will bring into develop mode uh, because this is a good example of an image that I think is fairly fixable in develop mode without any uh, larger um, need to bring it into edit mode and, and really work on an image there. Just because there's some e quick and easy cloning and, uh, and sort of blending that can, be, that can be done to get rid of this sort of uh, uh, damage that's been done to the face here. Uh, and then thirdly, I just want to point out something too. Uh, so this is a great example of an image that I found on Flickr of this young girl. And it looks like some severe damage has been dealt to the sort of the central portion of our image. And so I have actually had several people contact me privately with their images that they, you know, older images that they had and saying like, hey, is there anything that can be done to fix this image? <clears throat> And in a case like this image specifically, which does match some of the images that I had been sent privately over email, the answer is not really. <laughs> so this is just such a damaged image that there's not enough reference material in the actual center of the image um, that you can ever use to really clone uh, and sort of rework this image. 
So this would be something where um, it would be fairly difficult to actually lovingly restore this image just because there's so much green and, and damage in the center of the image. And so I just want to point out sort of, especially while we're working with our images, sort of, I'm sort of trying to showcase what it is we can fix and certain elements that we maybe leave alone or, or we don't edit. And this is just a really good image that I wouldn't wouldn't spend your time on on trying to restore this. There's just not enough of the original image to to work with. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to point that out because I have uh, received a couple emails of people being like, "Hey, please, this image is you know of my great great grandfather," and I, I you know, I'm looking to and I have to say sorry. Unfortunately, this is just super damaged, and and a lot of the people are you know aware uh, of that in general, and it's just it's one of those things they just need to hear someone say it. So. So let's open up this image, this first image, and we're going to talk about some of the tools that you can use, uh, which in this case are going to be the repair tools within develop mode. And we'll just quickly update this image in develop mode because I'd like to spend a good portion of the of this, um, this video talking about um, frequency separation in edit mode, because a lot of these um, restoring of older photos will require you to work with layers. So, but first, let's just open this guy into develop mode right here. And we can talk a little bit about how we'd go about editing this image. So um, I don't actually know what this is. It looks like metallic strips or something like that that's been uh, that's come off of the image. And when they went to go scan it, it looks like it sort of uh, it incorporated those elements. But they're very unusual, and they're they're pop off right over here in, in the face. But these are fairly isolated, and they're super easy to get rid of. So we can do that quite quickly and efficiently using the repair tool. And I just want to make sure, can everyone see that little mouse effect of where I'm clicking the little blue highlight? I just want to make sure that that's visible. Um, okay, awesome. People can see it. That's great. I just wanted to double check that so people can see where I'm clicking. So if I go to the repair tool in develop mode, so like I said, I'm in develop mode, I can just click on this repair tab. So there's four tabs in develop mode. Uh, tune and detail are probably the ones that you're, you're gonna spend the most of the time in, in terms of editing your images, because in this case, they uh, apply to the tonality of your image and then the color and light of your image. But for stuff like this, we have to use a repair tool. So, um, and uh, as with develop mode, in the sense that develop mode is fully non-destructive and a parametric editing tool, all of the adjustments that we're going to be making to this uh, image are going to be non-destructive, which is a huge benefit that development has, or rather develop tool has over some of the things we're going to be talking about in edit mode. So with the repair tool active, um, I would recommend not using heal for larger elements like this. And let's see if I can showcase why. So if we were to take our heal tool here, and what you do with heal is you right click to set a sort of starting point, and then you right click to a set uh, where you're um, uh, where you're going to be uh, basically what you're going to be applying over. So what you're doing with heal in this case is you're sort of um, right clicking and left clicking, and what it's going to do is it's going to paste over that element. Uh, in specific parts of your image that have like really dramatic tone differences, um, you might see that the the uh, the heal tool will struggle with this, and it'll uh, it because it, it's not really it's it's doing a, a, a little bit of blending when it goes to apply that uh, that adjustment. And in fact, actually here, oops, uh, it looks like it did a fairly good job. Um, clone is sl subtle. Uh, slightly different, and that clone doesn't sort of keep in mind the tone and the um, the color of the space that you're or you're working with. It's literally going to be copying a specific part of your image that you select by right clicking. So when you go to do this, it's going to copy that exact element and all of the uh, the sort of um, the space that exists within your nib cursor when you're going to click on it. So cloning is useful for specific parts of your image, but something like this. Uh, it might make more sense to do a blend. Personally, for somebody, uh, for myself, I like to just do a blended clone. Uh, a blended clone is going to sort of merge these two methods. Uh, so a blended clone is going to uh, take um, parts of your image and you can just sort of work it in and it's gonna keep the sort of uh, the tone uh, of the uh, of the and the colors in the uh, sort of the background area, the area that you've clicked on, and it's going to do its best to sort of blend those elements in. And so what I can do is I can just go through this process by right clicking and left clicking to sort of repeating this element. Um, 
Is there, okay, so um, uh, Ted asked, is there a benefit to converting uh, to your image to black and white first? Um, I don't, I think in, in most cases, especially when you're working with older images, um, in this case, this image is clearly sepia tone, which, uh, you know, for the purpose of editing is treated as color and not black and white. Um, I would actually do the opposite in, in most instances where uh, when you're working with older images, um, what I would do is I would, um, I would do a, uh, a, a change your image to color if it is black and white. Uh, because there's probably a benefit to you maybe going through the process of colorizing your image um, or working with uh, things like filters that are going to apply a certain color over top of the image. So I would rarely leave it in black and white. Um, I would maybe convert it to color. But uh, for, the, uh, for what we're talking about here, when we're repairing our image, we're not really in, uh, utilizing, um, uh, there, there's nothing really that we're doing that's going to be um, you know, that impactful in terms of uh, color in our image, because a lot of these images in this case are sepia tone anyway. Um, um, so yeah, we're going to talk more about edit mode. So Gary asked, at a time convenient to you, Adam, please explain why to use develop versus edit. So we're going to be primarily talking about edit mode. I just wanted to sort of briefly pop in to edit mode, or sorry, develop mode, and uh, talk about how to sort of go through the process of quickly repairing your image. But the, the problem with develop mode is that these, the tools here are a little bit preliminary um, and uh, while fully non-destructive, which is the benefit of working in develop mode, uh, really what we're gonna be doing when we're, um, when we're working with an older image like this, what we're really gonna be doing is we're actually gonna be fundamentally changing the image itself. So we're going to go through the process of, uh, uh, you know, really, really substantially changing this image. Uh, and to do that, we sort of need to be working with layers. So we'll talk a bit about, more about that. But all I'm doing right now is I'm just going through my image and I'm left clicking uh, areas that I want to copy and right clicking areas that I'm going to be uh, pasting over. And in this case, it's fairly easy to go around and just uh, work in, th work in uh, these areas. There's a little bit of a coloration change here. And this is something that we're gonna talk about in edit mode, how to sort of avoid this. Um, but as for uh, this sort of section of the image, I might actually just as a final element here, might zoom in slightly and um, I'm going to clone out uh, that little portion there. There we go. And that would be about the change that I would make to this image. Uh, obviously in this case, we have a bit of a border problem because the border is pretty, pretty nasty looking. So I'd go through the process of going to the geometry tool uh, and then we would crop this image. I'm going to crop the sides down. So it sort of all exists within the image here. And I'd probably settle on something like that for our final image for, for this. This is about the control we have in develop mode is the ability to go through this cloning process, uh, repairing and blended uh, cloning and healing away uh, different parts of our image, which again is just setting a starting point and then right clicking to cover over those elements. Now, like I said, the cool thing about this is it's non-destructive. So if at any point I want to open up my image, right, and go back into develop mode, uh, there's my edited image and I want to make some adjustments or see what the original image look like, that sort of thing, I can go back and it's, like I said, fully non-destructive. So the ability for me to go to process, for example, and restore to original, all of these processes can be done and this image is, uh, can, be, can be returned to its original state. Um, Ted asked, is there a benefit to, oh yeah, we already answered that. Let's see here. Okay, so with that being said, let's actually focus on a little bit more of a complicated job and start uh, bringing in this image in this case into edit mode and talk about the features in edit mode and how they sort of uh, can help us work through this problem of, of this image here. So our image, let's just have a little quick examination of it first. So it is a bit grainy, but it's actually not that bad. So uh, when I say grainy is I'm looking at the actual image itself for a uh, noise. So what noise will look like in your image is it'll look like uh, very visible squares. Um, but, and you'll see this obviously as you zoom in, but our image actually is fairly good quality. Uh, let's see here. Actually, how big is it? 
It's not even that big. It's only 1600 pixels by 2300 pixels, but it does appear to be not that grainy. So the noise reduction process that we're going to apply at the very end will be quite light, but it is damaged. Um, there's whole swaths over here where there's some serious, uh, what appears to be their light or water damage to the image. This section is going to need huge overhaul. We're going to have to do a couple strategies to get rid of this blotch right here. And then the other thing is we'll probably need to do a very similar process to that, what we did in develop mode um, with taking away all of these sort of granular little uh, scratches that the image has suffered over time. So um, in develop mode, can you undo edits individually and out of order? Uh, you can undo them individually by backing up through them. I'm not sure if you can undo them uh, uh, like out of order. So when you're making edits in develop mode, there's a little um, undo redo button and go through the process of just either clicking through undo or uh, you can use the um, uh, control Z to undo them. Uh, there's also a history panel in develop mode as well. Let's see, I think now that I've edited it out of the image, um, they might not show up in the history panel. Yeah, um, let's see here, yeah. So once you exit out of your image, the history is then uh, purged in this case. But if we were to make a new change, for example, uh, if we were to go to blended clone, for example, and get rid of these portions here, you start to see those adjustments appear. Now, let's see if I can edit. I don't believe I can edit. Go back to in this case. So when I click on these, it goes back one individually. So um, it's not as though I can uh, undo individual elements. I'd have to go back and, and sort of re re restart through that. But this history panel does give me the ability to see what it looks like after each individual adjustment in this case. Um, uh, I went in back to edit and uh, development all in history was preserved. I wonder, uh, hmm, I wonder why that would be, because in this case, I've made a fair number of changes. It's possible that my, the change that I made to the geometry over uh, overrode some of the uh, clone adjustments I made uh, in, with the repair tool, just because in this case, I've then cropped my image. So that's maybe why that's occurred, but either way. Um, let's go back into our other image here. No, it was saved during develop mode, uh, John. Um, <clears throat> so, Okay, so we, we have our image here and we wanna get rid of uh, these, these little elements here and we wanna address some of these concerns down here as well. Now, there's a tool uh, in edit mode, which is called frequency separation. Now, historically what we've used frequency separation for is to, or at least the ones that the things that I've showcased, how do you, uh, what to do with frequency separation is to get rid of like stray hairs that exist in our image. I've used it a lot actually to talk about um, removing uh, facial blemishes. Um, and so what frequency separation does is it takes our image and it fundamentally splits it into two separate images. And those two images uh, are one that contains the color elements, uh, in this case, the low pass elements of our image, and one image that contains the texture, the detail uh, of our image that is contained within the high pass element of our image. And so what this does, it allows us you to interact with texture and color distinctly and separately. And this is hugely useful for editing images like this. So let's showcase how to do this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my base image here and I'm actually gonna duplicate it. And the reason why I'm duplicating it is because frequency separation is a destructive edit to our image, okay? And uh, when we go to make all of these adjustments, we're gonna be making destructive adjustments to our, our image. By duplicating our image, what we can do is we can sort of preserve or keep our original image in the layer order so that we have it as a reference photo. So what I'm also gonna do is once I have my duplicated image here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click it. And if you right click it, you'll see a bunch of different options pop up. One of which is frequency separation, which is what we're gonna be principally using to edit our image today to restore this photo. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on it and I'm gonna click on frequency separation. Now what frequency separation will do is it'll bring up this little window that's asking you what you wanna do in terms of the high pass and low pass elements of our image. So this low pass element, uh, it looks like a blurry version of our photo. 
Uh, and you can see that the colors are preserved in this, uh, this low pass image versus the high pass image where most of the textures are visible, especially in the face and the uh, upper portion of the plane here are visible, but uh, the image is fundamentally a grayscale. So there isn't any color in this. And so what frequency separation is doing is it's actually creating two separate images using your image. Now, you can play around with the blur radius. In this case, I have it set to 22, but you can see if, uh, if I change it, uh, especially when I increase the blur radius, there's gonna be a bit more color introduced into this high pass. Uh, looks like the low pass is even blurrier. I generally am going to leave my uh, with the default settings that it has suggested, which in this case was about 22, I believe. So I'm going to just stick with the defaults for the purpose of this uh, tutorial, uh, and we'll showcase what it's going to do from there. So with that uh, default set in mind, we're basically just having a look at what these two layers look like, and you can see the difference in them. When we're done with frequency separation, we're just gonna click the done button. And what it's gonna do is it's actually gonna create that layer for us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rename uh, my bottom layer here, cause this is the original. So I'm gonna call it that. I'm gonna right click and rename my image here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click and rename my second image, which is the low pass filter. And we can see that by hiding the topmost section here. We can see that this is the low pass filter that is just the color in this case and trying to remove as little of that texture detail as possible. So we're gonna right click this and we're gonna call this low pass uh, color. And what I'm gonna do is now I'll hide the, both the original and the low pass and we'll showcase the topmost layer which is this texture layer. And you can see that this texture layer has a blend mode of linear light currently. I'm gonna right click on this and I'm gonna rename it and we're gonna call it high pass. Uh, we'll just put texture in, um, uh, in parentheses there. Uh, and this is just gonna help for referencing these when we go through making these adjustments here. So, now you should all see, you can see that we have three layers here. We have the high pass layer, the low pass layer, and the original layer. Does everyone understand why I made that duplicate of that original layer? Is because we're going to be going through the process of sort of making destructive changes to this high pass and low pass. I just want to make sure that everyone can see these three layers and understands why we have them here. Yeah, John, you're right. Um, I, the reason why I renamed them in this case is because my actual layer itself had such a long name that was just a bunch of numbers. So I just want to have something to reference, but they do actually add the uh, LF low pass and or low frequency and high frequency. Uh, Lauren uh, or Lonra said, can see, would uh, you just not want to be able to have a separate original copy? You certainly can. Uh, Lonra, um, the reason why I'm doing this now uh, while I'm editing is, okay, let's say you just have an original copy in the same folder, but you're not actually editing it. I just want to maintain this original just in case I make some adjustments that I'm unhappy with. Uh, and if I have this original in my layer panel, then it's very easy for me to work with that original, even if I've done some damage to a layer that I don't like. So I just want to keep this in mind. This is really just, you don't need to do this. Okay. Like I'm just doing this because uh, it's good practice. <laughs> it's good practice to keep some form of original layer, especially when we're working with our images here. So what we're going to do now is let's deal with the top portion. Okay. We're going to deal with the high pass first because it's the easiest one to deal with. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hide my other two layers. And all I want to see is this high pass layer. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into this layer and uh, we're gonna use the filter panel. So in ACDC, um, in ultimate and in, in edit mode, there's three sections of our user interface, okay? So up here is this filter menu. So this filter menu and use large and has a ton of different adjustments. Then we obviously have our toolbar, a toolbar up at the top here, which has various tools that we can use. We have our preview section, which also contains our film strip down at the bottom here. Um, and then we have our right portion, which is the layers and the adjustment layers. And in this case also includes our info palette. So the layers and the adjustment layers down here, 
if you think about these in general as non-destructive adjustments, this would be a correct to assume because all these adjustments can be edited in the future when we save our files in ACDC file. So what I want you to get into the habit of understanding is that on the right-hand side here are our non-destructive adjustments. And generally speaking, this filter power panel, which appears on the left here, is our destructive adjustments. And so when I take this high pass layer here, my high pass texture, and I bring this into the repair tool, I just need to know uh, that I'm making destructive adjustments within the repair tool. And that's why we made that copy of our, our, our of original image there. So let's go into the repair tool and we're gonna zoom way in and we're gonna start to the process of either a mixture of blended cloning, uh, but I think for most of these, I'm probably gonna use the smart erase tool to smart erase these little uh, blotches here. So if I scroll down to the bottom here, what I can do is I can use Smart Erase, which is the fourth on our list. And what Smart Erase does is it erases that element. Um, it tries, oops, that's way too, there we go. Um, it tries to its best to erase an element based on referencing the pixels that appear around it. Uh, it does a fairly good job um, most of the time. Uh, and I like to lean on this tool as much as possible before using something like Blended Clone. But if we go through and we just little, literally click on these specs, right? These little specs that appear all over our, our um, the hull of this, uh, um, pardon me. Oops, that might be one better suited to blended clone. If we do our go through this process of just clicking on these, um, you can see that they will disappear and they'll try to do their best to maintain the texture of the, uh, the sort of areas that, are, that go around the actual spec in this case, the sort of uh, the damage, the uh, that uh, damage that you see. So what I'm going to do is I'm and I'm just work, working specifically on texture. What I'm interacting with is just the texture. It is not the color of my image. And so I'm just going to we're going to go through the pull thing here. I don't want to miss a single one. We're just going to make sure to click on on all these little specs and sort of incorporate them into the pixels that appear to, around them. Uh, this, there is no smart erase in the develop mode. Uh, that's Raymond. That's why uh, that appears there. Uh, it's it's in uh, edit mode and it isn't in the develop mode uh, section there. Um, we do have blended clone, which was added into the uh, the um, the develop mode there, which is really useful and can do in many ways a sort of similar operation. It's just a uh, smart erase hasn't been incorporated into the uh, develop mode yet. Um, I hope that they do. So as you can see, as I'm going through here, you're seeing these little specs uh, uh, disappear as I go through the process of smart erasing those elements. And there might be a couple that we're gonna have to do a blended clone uh, instead. Although this seems to be doing a fairly good job and I haven't had any issues yet. Blended clone uh, might be more useful um, when you have a spec that appears next to some texture you wanna preserve. For example, Right here, if we were to go through the process of uh, smart erasing that, what you'll see is that texture will disappear right there. And we don't actually want that. Uh, what we might wanna use is blended clone in this instance, because when it, you see I make a right click over here, you can see that I can actually preserve the characteristic of that little uh, riveting that appears there. And so blended clone is more useful for a section like that because it allows us to take that texture element and sort of copy and blended it nicely in there. I just want to make sure people understand the difference between smart erase and uh, uh, blended, uh, blended clone. So smart erase isn't very good at determining texture. And recently I did a workshop um, when we were talking about a floor and the floor had a lot of um, uh, like patterning on it in the sense that it had like a checkerboard pattern to it. And a uh, smart erase wasn't very good at uh, understanding what the pattern of the floor was. So we had to use blended clone in that instance to sort of uh, copy the clone and, and of, the, of the floor and, and move it in relation to the pattern uh, that already existed there. Um, yeah, you certainly can, Charles. So we can do this whole section. I'm just going to increase my nib width. Uh, the reason why I'm doing smaller portions is because Smart Erase, what it does, right, 
is, uh, is it references the areas around it for information. And so when I go to smart erase a specific part here, if my nib width is too broad, what it might do is it might replace that section. Um, I actually did a pretty good job, uh, but what it do, might do is it might replace that section with other specs uh, because it's referencing the areas around it. Um, and so I just wanna be uh, mindful of that. You saw when I, I painted on that texture there, although I did a really good job, wow. Uh, but it does also, the problem with that is it does copy certain elements. So when I did that, let's see if it will do it again. It's capturing little elements from the corner of this. It's sort of taking little pixels from parts that I don't want. So I'm just sort of trying to find a healthy middle ground of using uh, smaller brush sets to use less of the areas that exist around it. Uh, Charles, does that make sense why I would sort of maybe use a smaller brush size when using Smart Erase? Uh, I just want to make sure that that's understood um, because I obviously can and, and there's instances where that, that worked really well. Um, I'm not, my point is I'm not trying to waste anyone's time here is I, what I'm really trying to do is to just do a very uh, a good job of sort of trying to get rid of as many of these speckles as possible and not uh, creating more work for myself while using a much larger brush. But we're almost done here or we're almost, I'm almost happy with it here. I'm just gonna get rid of a couple more in this area and then we can sort of talk about the next section. Um, and this is the thing about restoring a photograph too, is uh, there is, there's fast ways to do it, but your fast ways might result in a, uh, in not necessarily the best outcome in terms of your overall image. And I think we can get, by the end of it, I really would like to have like a wow factor type finish to this and be able to say, well, this is super different from our original image. So I'm trying to capture as many of these little white specks and get rid of them as possible. Uh, I'm just gonna go through here. This is another good example of an area that might blended clone might be better. Use blended clone here. Um, so I wanna preserve some of the texture of that. That looks pretty good. Maybe this one would be a good subject for blended clone too, just cause I don't wanna get too, there we go, that's looking good. This has got a little bit of texture underneath it as well. So this is probably a better subject for blended clone as well. So I'll just take these different elements from down here and move them up there. And as you can see, I sort of was able to preserve that line there. Uh, this one's gonna be interesting. I think we could probably smart erase this guy. Just gonna click hold and see what it does. Pretty good. Uh, this one, this one might just be regular old clone. I can get rid of this. And then as for this section here, I think what I'll do is I'll use blended clone right here. And I'll just drag it over. John, uh, that's okay. Uh, just a reminder that this will be uploaded to our, uh, our YouTube channel. So you can see it there if you want to see it in the future. Uh, I'm going to go through, I'm just going to do some blooded cloning here. And I'll take this section here, add it up there. And so that's sort of doing a fairly good job of getting rid of that. I don't love this right here. So what I might do, see what other elements we can take. Uh, unfortunately, it might just be this. Let's see if I can just paste it like right there. Give a little bit of texture to that area where it might. Oh yeah, that's looking way better. Oh yeah, that's perfect actually. So I did a fairly good job. Does everyone understand why I'm alternating between blended clone and smart erase for these? Is that making sense? Okay, awesome. And you're seeing that this is like, you know, it's a fairly time consuming process, but there, you do have a bit of control but with these two tools. Um, Timo asks, it seems that my Photo Studio Home version does not have a developed tool, correct. And edit mode is way more limited, correct. As a conclusion, I might as well go, to, okay, yeah. This is definitely gonna be uh, focusing more on, uh, on uh, uh, like we were talking about, um, so the develop mode aspect that we're talking about, the repair section, uh, that's going to be something uh, that is going to be possible in professional and ultimate. Uh, and then uh, as for, um, you know, the, the changes that we're making right now, Timo, they require ultimate. And in general, the workshops are always uh, geared towards, uh, pardon me, especially when it comes to um, the edit mode functions. 
uh, they're always going to be geared to ultimate. Uh, we do do workshops that are geared towards home users when it comes to uh, management functions, digital asset management, that sort of thing. Uh, it, you know, I'm not trying to waste your time, but that is something that we want to focus on is, is that we want to focus on showcasing our uh, most comprehensive product. So that's why we're covering ultimate. Um, so I'm just about done here. Click through a couple more here. And I think that's, pre I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm just going to click done. And when I'm done, what's going to happen here is this, uh, this would be saved. And so now what you can already see is that uh, this, this uh, layer has been um, destructively adjusted in this case. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save uh, this as an ACDC file. And the reason why is because I don't want my, uh, to lose any uh, adjustments. Uh, let's say adjustments uh, restore. I'm just going to save this as an ACDC file now while we're working on it. And that gives me the ability to sort of uh, open this uh, image up in the future, open this ACDC file and continue to make adjustments. So high pass is what we're seeing right now. Let's showcase the low pass. Okay, so this is what our image looks like. Okay, after we've gone through the high pass layer um, and we haven't interacted with the low pass layer yet. And if I show saved, or actually if I show original here by just hiding these other two layers, you can already see the difference in terms of the image. So uh, what this texture adjustments uh, has done to our image here. So this was our original image prior to any adjustments. And here is our image uh, with the high pass layer adjusted. So as you can see though, there's still color issues on the, on the image. It's just now the texture has re been removed from the color portion. Oops, did not mean to do that. But what I did mean to do is showcase that these sections right here, right, we're going to have to go through the process of working on this low pass layer and uh, removing these elements and definitely working in the corner here. So when we're working with our low pass layer, uh, in the past, what I've recommended is people open up into the blur tool. But in this case, actually, with how spotty these uh, sections are, I actually am going to open up into the repair tool once again. We're just repairing these layers uh, through um, we're just going to be re repairing them in this case, interacting with the color of the layer, not the texture of the layer. So we're going to take this low pass layer. And once again, we're going to bring it into the repair tool and we're going to do a very similar function on this, uh, this part of our image. Now we're just going through the process of, in this case, uh, taking out these sort of, um, globby color bits. So again, I've used blur in the past for certain elements here as well. Uh, and blur works well, uh, but blur is also going to take certain parts of color um, and uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna do its namesake actually. It's going to, oops, um, it's gonna blur those elements a bit too much. Uh, the Gaussian blur element, uh, it might be a bit better suited to something like uh, a facial uh, imperfection, like a zit or something like that. Whereas uh, this, uh, you know, uh, cloning and, and blended clone function might be better suited to something like this, which has a lot of these sort of little specs on them. So I'm just going to go through and I'm just using the blended clone section here to take out those little elements. We're going to take out these really blotchy white spots here by just blending them in. This section, as you notice, is quite a bit faster than doing the texture portion because these elements don't contain any texture. And therefore what we're doing is we're really just sort of preserving the color area, um, you know, the, the areas uh, of color around our image. So we're gonna take those out. And we're just about done this bottom portion here. And then we're gonna focus on the hard part of this image, which is that really blotchy bit. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Um, now let's talk about this guy right here. Take that out as well. That's pretty good. I still see this one here too. I wanna to get rid of this guy. There we go. Okay, so this guy is gonna work a bit differently. So you have this color section right here and this is, we need to get rid of this guy. Um, so the problem with this section here is we have very little reference color, okay? Um, so what it's going to it's going to cause us to do is basically we need to start filling it in little little chunks here, especially this white area, because we're going to take this white section here, 
we're gonna we might need to clone it actually yeah we're gonna have to clone it i think we're gonna take this section and we're gonna move it into the area here and we're gonna slowly work from what we've developed. In the essence, now we have a little bit more room to work with because we've sort of pushed this, uh, this area in. Uh, let's do a good job of sort of trying to blend those sections in. And what we can do is we can deal, once we're like satisfied with the, uh, the space, the sort of shape of the space in general, what we can do is we can sort of address the color using layers in edit, uh, in edit mode. But I'm just going to try to go through and just preserve the shape as best I can of getting rid of this sort of uh, splotch here. And then I'm going to try to blend those in. Yeah. And then this section down here, push some of this color in here and blend it in. And then this section right here is going to be a bit of a challenge to sort of manage the two color spaces. I want to see what this is going to look like afterwards. Let's just zoom out sli slightly. What we're trying to avoid is any of this sort of really granular. Um, yeah, that's looking a bit better. Uh, I still wish I had more shape, but we'll let's see what we can do here. I'm just wanting to try to preserve as much of that shape as possible, the natural sort of, while you know, doing our best to get rid of this color here. And then I don't know, we can also just play around with Smart Erase in this area as well. Yeah, that does a pretty good job too. Yeah, this is a tough spot. Okay, let's um, let's go back to edit mode and we'll see if uh, what we have here is is going to work. It's looking a bit better. It's still such a focal point for me though. Okay, let's hit done and let's zoom out and let's combine the two layers together. So now that we have our low pass layer, we're going to take our high pass layer and we're just going to click them on. So we have we're seeing both at the same time. So, uh, you know, this is still a challenge area for sure. I'm gonna have to spend more time here, but with the two combined, you can see that we've gotten rid of a ton of these little speckle marks that appear in the bottom section here. We've preserved the color and the shape of the, uh, you know, uh, of this area, especially some of the details in where the riveting is. Uh, we've completely gotten rid of those big splotches that appear here. And just, uh, I guess for reference, what we'll do is we'll move the original file on top and I'll just showcase the original in comparison to the new adjustments. Does everyone see sort of what we've been able to get rid of and how we've been able to homogenize those two layers together? Yeah, that area right there, that's really gonna take some time. It might actually be best to blur that area, to be honest. We'll see. The other thing is I'm not sure how much of the texture I was able to remove from that area too. Okay, so that's sort of the differences between the two. Well, let's have another look at that high pass layer. Let's see what we can do in this area here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do that, go back to the high pass tool, and let's go look at this corner here. And we're going to go, uh, let's see what it'll do if I just smart erase this section right here. Oh, not bad. Not bad. Ooh, this might happen. Smart race right here. Yes, this is good. And then I'll just blended clone out the bottom portion here. Nice. So now let's see the two together. That's the original. This is the two without. And if I'm saying, I think the only thing this needs now is to probably do a little color adjustment in this area. Yeah, that's looking way better. There's way less damage in that area now. So this is a before, this is an after. I just don't like that little golden area there too, because it's very clearly, but it's so hard to get rid of because we lack the white in that area. So what we need to do now is we need to go to, yeah, let's go to the, go in, add an extra layer. 
So I'm going to add a layer. Uh, let's add a layer above our high pass layer here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a vibrance layer. Okay. And so this is a uh, non-destructive layer. So I'm going to add vibrance in here. And what I want to do is I'm going to try to desaturate this yellow section here. Um, in order to do this, I don't want to desaturate my whole image. So this is what, if I didn't, this is what I'm doing. This would be my desaturation of my whole image. And as you can see, it does, uh, it does remove this area as a problem element uh, by desaturating it. It sort of makes it all look very uniform. Uh, but the problem is we lose our nice color in our image. We lose that nice sepia tone and we don't want to do that. So what we want to do is we want to have this vibrance layer affect just this one portion of our image. And we're going to use a brush to do that. But in order to make this vibrance uh, layer affect our whole image, I'm sorry, affect just that selection of our image, first what we need to do is we actually need to invert this layer. And this uh, requires you to know a little bit about layers. So uh, layers have, uh, or sorry, adjustment layers have these little masks that appear to the left of them, this little white box. Now, what this uh, means is that when you've made a vibrance adjustment, right, let's just desaturate that part of our image, the whole image. What it's, this mask is telling, telling us in this case is desaturate everything that appears as white. So in this case, white is turning this effect on. Um, what we need to do is we need to actually invert this to black. And what it's gonna do is it's going to be treating it exactly the opposite. So it's gonna be saying, apply this vibrance adjustment to the white part of your image. And then it sees that this mask is all black and by process uh, affects to no, basically nothing. And in this case, it turns this effect off for the whole image. The beauty about uh, masks, they exist in this binary. So white is on and black is off. What this enables us to do actually is we can take this mask now. And if we use the brush tool itself, so literally the brush up at the top here, and we paint on white, what that enables us to do is actually apply that effect in the area that we've brushed on. And so in the case of this vibrance adjustment, right, um, in order to get rid of this damaged area, this yellow damaged area here, well, all I need to do is take this brush and brush on white in that area. And um, that does a fairly good job. Let me just zoom in. Fairly good job of getting rid of that colored element there. That sort of, uh, that looks like it was almost like a coffee stain or something like that. Now, this is very small, but I do want to point out that if we reference our mask again on this vibrance adjustment, can everyone see that little yellow speck that exists on the top left-hand corner? I just want to make sure that that's visible. Is that speck visible to you, the audience? Because <laughs> that speck contains a lot of information. So that speck is where uh, we've turned that portion off. So, um, so what you should see is this little black box here with this little white section right here, which corresponds to the white section of our image. So when this effect is being applied, this little vibrance adjustment, right? So it's desaturating this image, but it's only desaturating the white place that we've selected here with this mask. So if I click on the vibrance adjustment, for example, and I was to do the opposite, I'd highly saturate that section. Now it's highly saturating that area. And so what we can do is we can turn this vibrance off until we're sort of comfortable with it. And if I desaturate it to about 50 there, it still preserves a little bit of the bluishness in our image here, but completely gets rid of that gold portion. So we don't have to fully desaturate to sort of totally problematize and get rid of that area. Now this image is looking pretty good. It's actually looking way, 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 way better than what we started with. And again, for reference, this is what we started with. Um, and this, the whole process to sort of summarize so far is we, we clicked on our original image, we right clicked to make a frequency separation. And then within that frequency separation, we isolated the problem parts of our image. And we just used a combination of blended clone smart erase, and in some cases, a little bit of just general cloning to get rid of those elements that we didn't like in our image. But because we've split it into both texture and color, that enables us uh, to be way more refined, A, in our adjustments, 
And B, it actually works as a bit of a safety protocol in the sense that we're not um, really screwing around with our image and cloning an image just in general, um, we could get away with like we did in the develop mode earlier to our original image there. We can get away with a little bit of that because there's uh, there's only a little bit of, uh, or in the case of our original image there, there was enough white space around those um, imperfections that allowed us to get away with it. But for an image like this, uh, there isn't as much, uh, you know, negative space in our image. There's a lot of detail and, and for that. And when we're interacting with that level of detail, it's probably in our best interest to make a frequency separation in this case. So we've done ahead, we've gone ahead, frequency separation. We've worked with both the high pass, the texture layer and the low pass, the color layer. We've gone in and we've right clicked all the little elements of our, our, our that we wanted to blend out or clone out or smart erase, that's our thing. And then after that, what we did is we just took the vibrance adjustment. And um, what we did is uh, we're using vibrance to just uh, sort of take away any element in our image that is either too bright or too speckled in our image that we want to remove and sort of homogenize with the remainder of our image. Uh, Rudy says, Adam, thanks. I have to get up very early. Uh, oh, yes, you're doing some touristing, are you? Uh, well, have fun with that, Rudy, and thank you for participating. Um, Tom asked, since blended clone and smart array seem to be more advanced than heal and clone, is there any reason to ever use heal and clone? We did cover this a little bit. I, so to, just to be clear, I rarely use heal, but Tom, uh, I do use clone. Um, the instances when I use clone is when I'm trying to perfectly preserve sort of um, the edge of something. So uh, in the example earlier, oops, uh, I used clone right here to sort of clone this section in order to um, uh, sort of get rid of this little portion right here. So I wanted to perfectly clone this element and apply it right there. And the reason why is because this bottom section, this gray here and this white section here are identical to the white section here and the gray section here. The, the time where you'd wanna to switch to something like blended clone is when there is a bit of an ombre difference or a change of, um, will be the term for a gradiential change. Because when you go to clone that element, if there's a gradiential change in color, then it's gonna look really off-putting. So you'd maybe wanna to stick to something like blended clone for that. But when the colors are flat and perfect, clone is the best way to sort of get that same effect. Hopefully that makes sense to you, Tom. Um, awesome, oh yeah, I see, <laughs> okay, sorry. I answered it twice, but there's no, no problem with that. Jim asked, wouldn't it be faster to skip the frequency exception and do all the coal on the whole image? So yeah, I, I would say that it would be faster depending on the amount of damage to the image. I don't think faster is better for this kind of, uh, this kind of image, right? Because we're, when we're restoring an image, I think what we want to do is be super particular about the image and actually uh, get as much detail out of our original image as possible. I mean, we're restoring an image. We're not just like making a correction uh, sort of edit to our image. So in the case of answering this question, I think, Jim, I would use your best um, discretion and, uh, and sort of best understanding of your image to decide whether or not you want to use something like uh, frequency separation. My guess is, is that uh, you're probably going to have an image at some point in your life where your regular process of cloning and blending isn't going to work in the confines of your image. It's going to become too splotchy. And then when you actually zoom out on your image, you're going to go, whoa, like I actually need to slow this down and work on a much more uh, incremental area. And that's probably where you're going to want to use uh, frequency separation uh, to preserve as much of that detail in the high pass layer and as much of the color within the uh, sort of the low pass layer. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it just really depends on what you're working with. But this is a tool in your arsenal, right, Jim? Like this is one more tool that you have, uh, have access to uh, to now better restore an image. Ib said, Adam, thanks for the great review of an old photo editing. Also woke up early. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ib. Uh, Barbara asked, could vibrance be used in place of a low pass entirely for the big orange spot? Yeah. Okay. So this is a great question. Thank you, Barbara. So um, Barbara, do you see my vibrance layer and how it appears beneath the high pass right, or sorry, appears above the high pass right now? Well, what I can do is I can actually take this vibrance and move it beneath the high pass. So the texture layer, right? So when I do that, 
uh, this layer is the vibrance is now only being applied to the low pass layer. It's not being applied to the texture that appears ab above it. Um, so in, say you had a layer that existed underneath, right? Uh, your low pass layer. Uh, let's see here. Um, when you uh, when you move layers, right? And adjustment layers, let's give a good example of this. Let's add a photo effect. Uh, let's apply a photo, photo effect. And let's do a, I don't know, uh, do a, let's something that would look reasonable. Yeah, let's do this process uh, photo effect, okay? So this photo effect, right, uh, currently exists beneath the high, high pass. Um, adjustment layers in general, uh, they're going to be applied to your whole image. But um, what, because layer order matters, uh, when you move this layer beneath other layers, right, uh, that effect is now not applying to the layers that appear above it, right? It's only being uh, uh, applied to the uh, layers that appear beneath it, uh, which in this case is uh, layer one, which is a blank layer. Um, in order to apply a photo effect or some other form of adjustment layer, what appears beneath here, these ones down here, to apply these uh, just on a single layer, the single layer that exists beneath it, what you would do is you just click this clipping mask right here. And what this clipping mask does is it links this effect to the layer that exists directly beneath it and no more. Um, so if there was other layers that existed beneath, uh, in this case, the low pass layer, they're not going to be affected by this photo effect in the same way if it was just a generally applied. Um, so Barbara, in this case, the vibrance adjustment, right, can be uh, moved beneath the high pass texture to just apply to the low pass layer here, as it does right there. And if there was any other layer that you wanted to uh, uh, not have this vibrance layer effect, what you could do is you could just click on the clipping uh, right here and clipping would uh, enable that layer to uh, just be applied to, in this case, the layer that appears directly beneath it. Um, does that make sense, uh, Barbara? I haven't actually used clipping too much in this workshop. And I, I, I and so it, it is something that um, that is a little bit more advanced, uh, but I just want to double check that make, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay, well here, let me try, I'll try explaining it in a different way too. Let's do, let's add a couple, a couple blank layers and hopefully this will answer your question better, Barbara. Okay, so let's just hide all these layers right now, except for our two blank layers. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, I'm gonna fill my blank layer here with uh, blue. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm actually, instead of a blank layer, let's actually get a picture in here. Let's put a picture in here. So we'll put, um, let's put this, this guy. Um, actually, let's uh, put a different picture in here. Let's just search for just a general landscape image. Let's put this guy underneath, okay? Uh, you can't see it right now, but you will in a moment. So there's our, our picture, there's a mosque. <clears throat> and then there's our layer two that appears above it. So, um, so what we could do is we could add a vibrance adjustment again. Okay, so we're gonna add this vibrance adjustment and we'll change the hue. And so when I change the hue, what it's gonna do is it's going to affect this layer two right here. Okay, this blue layer. Um, now, if I, uh, if I, let's say, um, if I take a, an erase tool here and if I erase portion of it like that, Barbara, do you see that my mosque here is now very purple because there's this vibrance adjustment that's been applied? And that vibrance adjustment is being applied to both of those images. So right now the vibrance is set to, the hue is like negative 60 or something like that. And you can see this really green tinge because it's applying a negative 60 adjustment to the topmost portion here, but it's also applying it to that uh, blue layer. Do you see that? Do you see how that sort of vibrance effect is being applied to both? Okay, so now watch, now that you see that, if I click on the clipping mask, right? So now the vibrance adjustment, right, that was changing our mosque previously, now this vibrance adjustment is only effect affecting layer two. So this blue is being changed to red. Now the mosque is still its original colors because it's no longer clipped to that. So again, so uh, universal, clipped, universal clipped.
So when I clip a vibrance to the layer that exists directly beneath it, it's going to just affect that layer. When I have it as universal, all layers that exist beneath it are seeing that adjustment. Does that make sense, Barbara? That probably makes a bit more sense than previously because it's a bit easier to see in this case. Okay, cool. So clipping is pretty powerful. It's a, it's a unique tool that allows you to sort of bend the rule of, uh, in this case, adjustments. Um, yeah, let's get rid of those layers again here. Okay, so that's our image. Um, let's have a look at some other questions here. Bruno, same here, missed some steps. Yes, it will be uploaded to our workshop. John said, I didn't really follow how the vibrancy mask worked to get rid of that color spot there. Is there an online tutorial that reviews layers in more detail? Yeah, there's actually a bunch on our uh, tutorial section in our, um, our, our workshop page on YouTube. But um, let's tackle this a different way. Um, let me see if I can answer this question in a different way. Let's add a, let's add another, uh, let's, hey, tell you what, John, let's do this. Let's add a, um, what do we wanna do? Photo effect, something that would really change the image. Um, let's do a, oh, let's do a blur. This will make a lot of sense. Okay, John, so I have a blur adjustment. It's at the top of my layer order, okay? Um, let's make it so I just blur out, um, I blur everything but my person's face, okay? I wanna blur out the remainder of my image, but I don't wanna blur out the face. So how a mask works, how this vibrance mask works that we applied earlier, right? Is there's two colors that you can paint over top of a mask, black or white, right? Black turns the effect off, white turns the effect on. So because we're looking at my mask here, right? This is turned on. This means that my blur effect is turned on for my whole image. Let's take a brush, let's take a black foreground color, and let's just paint over top of his face. We're painting black over top of the cockpit here. Now, when we reference our thumbnail again, our mask thumbnail, you can see that there's a big, big black spot in the center of my mask thumbnail. So this black is telling me I have turned off the blur effect in that part of my image using the black brush. And for the remainder of this mask, right, this effect is turned on. By default, all of your adjustments are turned on, right? We're never interacting with these black or white because they're all by default turned on. I'm just saying that you can affect certain parts of your image. In the case, our, in our example earlier, when we had a um, big gold effect right here, well, we did a good job of sort of trying to, you know, uh, blend it away using the blend and the clone and smart erase and that sort of thing. But we still had this like big orange spot there. And so, well, what am I going to do? Well, okay, I think, well, how do I get rid of orange? Well, I can desaturate it so that I don't see it. I can see like the general texture there, but I, I can get rid of the orange. So by turning on vibrance, the effect is affecting the whole image, right? That by vibrance just on its, on its own, is, is affecting my whole image. So I need to go, well, how do I affect just that one area? So to do that, I need to first and foremost, set my mask to black because it turns the effect off for my whole image. And then what I need to do is I need to go, okay, well, where do I want to apply that? Well, I'll take a white brush this time because white is turning it on and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it off in that area. I will desaturate that one area. Glad you got it. Uh, but that's a really important step. Can you sharpen parts? Yeah, let's sharpen parts. So actually what I was going to do with my image now that I was sort of finished it, uh, I sort of got railroaded with a bunch of questions. But what I was going to do is I was going to make a curves adjustment just because I kind of want to make a general curves. I think that looks a little bit better. Darken certain parts, pick up the rest. And then what I want to do is let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's sharpen it. Let's take it into clarity. Uh, and let's add some clarity to my image here. And let's say uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't super keen on the clarity being applied to the rest of the plane. I just wanted to apply it to the cockpit again. 
Well, let's apply the exact same thing that John just asked me about. Let's set our mask black. And then let's use a white brush to just brush on a little bit of clarity in this area. And then let's increase those sliders until we sort of like the change. So we can apply a bit of an Orton adjustment, which looks good. Get in a bit there too. Uh, and then maybe we can adjust the radius. So, uh, so you can go through and you could add a little bit of clarity in one area there. And I'll know the, if I wanted to, I can add it on that rivet there as well. So that's a clarity adjustment that we could just add in a couple of selective spots using again, the mask there. Larry asked, please review how frequency separation of high and low was achieved. Sorry, I missed that part. Yeah, that's no problem, Larry. So let's uh, just take all of our layers and we'll hide everything but the original layer. I'm just gonna duplicate this original layer really quickly. All that is um, all you need to do in order to create a frequency separation, Larry, is you right click on your image layer. You go to frequency separation, which is down at the bottom here. And by clicking on frequency separation, you can um, play around with the adjustments uh, for basically the blur radius for the high frequency and the low frequency, but you don't necessarily need to. Uh, and I generally stick to the defaults and then you click done. And then what it'll do is it'll create these two layers. Uh, if you've made a duplicate of your image there, it'll create a two layer uh, just above that duplicate. And, um, and then there they are. And then they're indicated by an HF and an LF. Uh, which means low pass and high pass. Uh, hopefully that answers your question on how to achieve a frequency separation, Larry. Uh, Steve asked, thank you, Adam, for showing some great image restoration techniques. You're most welcome, Steve. Yeah, I'm glad you got a lot out of it. Uh, let's take a look at some of these other questions. Need to go, says Dieter. Can one of your workshops please cover how to replace the white background with another image? Actually, we've covered this a couple times in a, we actually have covered this in a workshop, Dieter. If you go to our workshop page on YouTube, um, we, there was a workshop on how to replace the sky. Now, that being said, um, just a show of hands, maybe using the hand button um, is would you like to see Dieter's workshop idea? Would you like me to see me cover how to replace a sky again? Um, if that is, okay, yeah, yes. The answer is yes. Okay, great. I'll schedule that workshop. Oh, uh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, well, great suggestion, Dieter. I will, uh, I'll do that workshop again live so people can participate on that. Uh, but for those of you that want to see an older workshop where we cover that exact topic, um, it's on our YouTube page. But very clearly wants to be covered again. So, um, okay, let's see what other questions are there here. Uh, you're most welcome, Dieter, thank you. Uh, okay, so John asked, so we have a white blob. Again, uh, please ask the questions in the q and I just know some people seem to use the chat for that, but uh, if, if possible, um, use the uh, Q&A. Um, okay, but there was one here. Um, so if you use a white blob in both the high and low frequency layers, do you have to delete the blob in both layers? Should you do the obvious blob? Oh yeah, sure. You can definitely do that, John. That's a great point. Okay. So there's a big obvious blob that's easy to remove. Yeah. Maybe wh why don't you remove that, uh, using some form of cloning process, uh, prior to doing the frequency separation. Um, that might be easier, uh, especially if there isn't any textures that are going to get in the way. Um, yeah, but that's definitely something you can do before. You can do frequency separation at any point, right? It doesn't have to be at the beginning of your image editing. Um, so good question. Uh, Alex asked, I'm confused with Vibrance actually does. Okay, so Vibrance is here. Uh, so Vibrance is a tool that allows you to increase the saturation of your image. Um, so, uh, but Vibrance specifically is sort of a unique tool. Um, so saturation and Vibrance are very similar. Um, the difference is that Vibrance keeps in mind skin tone. Uh, how to explain this? Let's um, save this image. I'm gonna open up another image, one with a person in it, because it might make more sense. Okay, let's go to people. Let's find a person. Um, let's go to, yeah, this might work. Let's try it. I think 
this will be yeah we'll try this okay it's gonna go into this let's um let's make this effect okay so what does vibrance do so i'm gonna add a vibrance adjustment layer okay uh let's just crank the saturation okay so saturation uh is going to increase the saturation of all the colors in your images in your image uh, and I guess what it means is, so a totally desaturated image is turned into a grayscale. And a maximum saturated image is taking your colors in your image and uh, moving them higher up on their saturation slider. Vibrance does the same thing. Um, so, but it does it less so to the color orange. <laughs> um, so skin tone, uh, no matter your ethnicity, uh, and uh, sort of is always relatively orange. So I'm going to click on this. Oops, I'm going to click on that, I mean. Oh, there we go. So if I click on my subject skin tone, right, and I go to custom here, you'll see that the skin tone of my subject is orange. It's in the hue, the orange section of the hue, right? Uh, even if I go to somebody who has a darker skin tone, uh, like this person here, if I click on my subject here and I look at this, what do you know? It's still orange, still treated as orange for the purpose of, um, uh, you know, uh, for as a, as a color hue. If we go to a subject who is fair skin tone, if I click on that, I think this will still be treated as orange. It's we're just slightly closer to the red hue, but it's still within that, that area. Right. Um, so my purpose, my point is, is that vibrance does a very similar thing to saturation, right? But it ignores or tries its best to ignore the orange color spectrum. And the reason why is because uh, vibrance is used to increase the um, uh, the saturation of our image, but ignores in the in this case skin tone, complexion, right? So Alex, does that answer your question in regards to what vibrance actually does? So it, it's its its goal is to do something very similar to saturation, but it is useful for when you're editing images that contain people. Um, because it omits people and their skin tone. Uh, okay. Um, cranking it down. Uh, oops. She last cranking it down makes a white background. Uh, the vibrance? No, it'll turn it to grayscale. Um, Mark asked, can't you just grab a nearby color and use a paintbrush tool to paint that hue over the orange spot region? Photoshop has a paintbrush that has a variety of things. Can't you just grab a nearby color and use the paintbrush tool to paint? Yeah, you can do that for sure. It's not very good because it omits the, uh, the texture of that area. But if you're working with flat colors, Mark, that's a great way of, of, of dealing with that problem. So in the sense that if your background has a very, very flat color, uh, whether it be like white or red or something like that, and there's very little texture detail, um, that might be a good way of uh, sort of um, painting over those areas. Um, now, when it comes to frequency separation, uh, that's something that you could do within the low pass layer. Uh, that's also something that people do using the blur tool as well. Uh, they blur those elements within the low pass. Uh, but in general, you're losing texture when you do that. Um, so I would not necessarily recommend that for every image. Uh, Alex says that helps a lot. Thanks. But why did you apply to the airplane image, which was black and white? Um, the vibrancy adjustment. Oh, I think I lowered the saturation in that image. Let's go back to it. Um, and in that case, the purpose of that was to just desaturate. Let's find that, here we go. And when we're looking at, so we got the original there, low pass, high pass, there we go. So that vibrancy adjustment was being applied to the low pass layer and I decreased saturation. And the reason why is because in that area, I had a bunch of gold. And so by desaturating that area, uh, Alex, what I'm getting is I'm uh, turning those, I'm desaturating them and I'm bringing them closer to gray, right? I'm sort of uh, bringing them closer to the grayscale because I'm removing the saturation from the color orange in that area. 
Um, Freddie asked, Adam, I'm still having problems with the ruler not displaying the size correctly. Now I'm having a problem with the color and the brush. I'm wondering if ACDC photos to delete and restore. Uh, send me an email, Freddie. Uh, I probably don't have the answer to that in this workshop. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, Margaret asked, do you plan to desaturate the image and remove the rest of the color? No, I didn't. I kind of wanted to keep the sepia tone. I actually really like the color in this image, Margaret. Um, basically, this would be, was my finished product. Um, I didn't really want to play around. Let's remove some of these extra layers here, just so you can see what I mean. Um, we don't necessarily need the clarity. I would add the curves, though. That's that's sort of what I would, I would uh, consider a finished product for this image. So just a bit of a curve adjustment to get some more depth out of those blacks and uh, and, and sort of the shadows and highlights. But uh, the high pass layer with the vibrance just in that one spot to remove that one spot right there uh, in terms of the gold colors there. The low pass layer and the high pass layer with all of their various adjustments. And that's sort of, I was really happy with that. I like that. You can get rid of all the color if you want. So I could add a vibrance adjustment to the very top most portion uh, of my layer order and I can desaturate that. But what's the point? I already have these nice colors that exist there. Um, you know, this is an aesthetic choice at the, at the end of the day. So if you prefer to have a black and white image, you can desaturate it. But I, I kind of like the combination of both. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Margaret. That would definitely be something you could do. Um, are you going to are you going to get rid of the glop at the bottom of the pick? Glop. There's no glops at the bottom of the pick. There is uh, this uh, what looks to be a bootstrap to get into the cockpit, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that needs to be there. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I believe that's for the the pilot's foot. <laughs> Carl asked, how do we save all the layers into a single image? Okay, so when you're done uh, your, your file, um, so I saved my file as an ACDC file. And the reason why I did that is because it preserved the layer order. It preserves all these layers. What you would do, Carl, is you would just go to save as again. In this case, in order to flatten your image, you can flatten your image by saving it as a JPEG, or you could save it as a TIFF file, or even a, a PNG if you'd like. But to flatten your image, uh, let's just rename this and call it flattened uh, JPEG. And what I'm going to do, it's going to tell me it's going to flatten the layer. And so now I've got these two layers in here. Um, one is flattened and the other is um, my ACDC file. So my ACDC file, because it contains all the layer information, is about 32 megabyte file. The JPEG that I just saved is like a 600 kilobyte file. So the substantially different uh, file size. Um, so that would be how you would flatten all the layers into a single image crawl. Uh, Mark asked, can you darken the sky and give it texture? Um, you could, this is colorizing an image, which is a bit different from restoring the image. Um, what you could do now that you sort of have this, um, is you could even add a new sky altogether, um, which actually is a pretty good point for the covering that workshop. Because what we could do is we could take out this little portion here and we could fill it with a brand new sky. And then uh, we could go through the process of desaturating that sky and make it sure like it fits with the image. Um, so uh, Mark, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> I think we might cover that in a, uh, another workshop. Tom asks, can you use frequency separation for sharpening an image? Uh, just sharpen the high pass layer. Yeah, I think you can. You can just take this high pass layer and sharpen it. Uh, let's bring it into sharpen. Um, and we could sharpen just this layer. Uh, like I could just increase the amount of sharpness, Tom. And when I go to save that, uh, now that adjustment has been applied, uh, let's see. If it, yeah, so it does remember, that's the difference, I guess. I don't know if it's visible to you on your computer, but it is to me. Um, it looks a little bit grainier uh, than it did before. And it does preserve a little bit of the sharpness in the image. It sort of strengthens some of the lines in the image. Um, I'm not sure if it's a better uh, image, but it is, it is possible to do that. Also, if you go into sharpen, uh, maybe you can sharpen specific parts of your image using the brush instead. So... Super doable to apply your high pass layer though, if that's the question. Uh, this is a PC, uh, we're using the PC software, Gary. Um, I, the Mac software does not have layers. So what we're talking about currently is PC exclusive. 
Barbara asked, I've also used a Mac AC to see how to sign up for the live online class. Um, how do you, well, you're, you're in it. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Okay. So, so generally we send out emails for these. Um, but what we can also do is let's just go to the ACDC website and I'll show you how to sign up for workshops in the future. So uh, if you go to our website, there's a section here. It says free ACDC workshops. If you click sign up, it's going to sign you up for the most recent workshop um, there. You can also navigate to ACDC workshops from the community portion here. And that will tell you what the current workshop is. Um, and you can sign up from this section as well. Hopefully that answers your question, Barbara. Ed Safford asked, is all the metadata carried over into the new ACDC file? Yeah, if you added any ACDC metadata, when you go to flatten your image, it's gonna be included in that saved file. Adam, what mouse program do you use to plastidate the circle on your screen? Oh, great question. Okay, I think it was just a free PC, um, like a, an add-on for, for PC. Uh, it's called Mouse Highlight uh, Catnip 5. So you should be able to just find this. I'm pretty sure this was, I just looked up like a, um, like a, a free uh, plugin for, for, for PC. And so that's what it is. Um, but yeah, it is kind of nice. It's helpful. Barbara, you're welcome. Freddie, thank you. Yeah, sorry I didn't have an answer for you, Freddie, but please email me. This is definitely something I'd like to help you with. Uh, Carl, thank you. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions in the chat that I missed, but it looks like we're good to go. And that's sort of it for the workshop today, friends. That's sort of all I had in mind to cover. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Stanislav. Uh, thank you, Andrej. Uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Louis, obrigado. Uh, boa noite. Uh, Brian, thank you. Um, Dennis, thank you so much. Rosemary, thank you. Like I said, it will be on our workshop page. Uh, and Stanislav was nice enough to link us to that playlist. So I'll link you again here. Uh, thank you, Stanislav. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, hopefully this was a helpful sort of instruction to you on how to deal with more complicated uh, restorations. Um, like I said, this is a project I would definitely recommend bringing into uh, edit mode and ultimate and applying a frequency separation and just kind of going through the process of quietly uh, blending out or uh, smart erasing those different specific elements that you don't want to see in your image. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really surefire way to get a, a good product. Um, thank you, Norm. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Carrie. Cool. Um, I think it's been about an hour and a half. I'm going to mute my mic. But thank you so much, everyone, for participating. If you have any questions uh, or you want to contact me uh, over email, my email is aprice at acdsystems.com. I do my best to answer any questions you may have. I do my best to, uh, if you have any suggestions for the product features you'd like to see in the product, please email me because uh, I send those to our developers. Uh, if you have any sort of questions where you need directed to support or something like that, I can help with that as well. But yeah, just please email me with any questions you may have. And uh, other than that, Dieter had a great suggestion for our next workshop. So we're going to do Skies. Replacing Skies will be our next workshop. So thank you for that suggestion, Dieter. And uh, yeah, I'm going to mute my mic now. Uh, my, my voice is growing hoarse. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.